All right, so Suraj here is a fourth year student who's going to talk to us about humanitarian aid. Suraj. Hey, uh, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you today about this project, which looks at whether the digital delivery of humanitarian aid can expand access and usage of financial services in low income settings across the world. This project kind of started out as several different research ideas, and this, we eventually kind of merged it into this. So, um, yeah, let's see how it goes. I think the broader context is something we might all be familiar with. Over the last two years, there's been this massive digitization of social protection programs across the world. Um, at last count, you know, the, there were over 150 programs in different parts of the world um, giving these digital transfers to people, um, emergency assistance to people, reaching about 750 million low-income individuals. Um, in most settings, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, the easiest way to do this, given the scale of the problem and many of the restrictions imposed by COVID and some of, other, some of the other constraints was through mobile money, um, because it's pretty ubiquitous there. Um, these pictures below are just some examples of government-run programs that did this. Um, the first one's from Brazil. The second one is something many of us might be familiar with, because uh, it was designed by Josh and Emily, who are here. I mean, who are at the high school, and many people are working on those projects. Um, and the last one is from Colombia. Um, yeah, I mean, this map just shows the scale of the, 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 the cash transfer, the, the wave of digitization that went up. Pretty much every country was giving social assistance in this form um, over the last two years. So, so the broad idea behind this project essentially starts with this question of what happens when you deliver cash in a mobile money account. Um, there's this general optimistic hypothesis that when you give people money in their mobile money accounts, they could gain familiarity with this new digital platform and eventually use it um, to access more complex and more complicated financial services downstream. I think the logic is that usually these transfers are targeted at very low income individuals um, who are often excluded from the traditional banking system. Um, so this is in many settings, the only and often the easiest way for them to access formal financial services. Prior evidence and prior, the prior research in this area of mobile money transfers has really not looked at this question of finance and financial services. It's mostly focused on broader outcomes such as welfare and efficiency gains for employers and things like that. There is a growing body of evidence coming out of um, a literature that's as a result of COVID, there are a number of studies looking at this question in many settings. Most of them seem to simply find that um, giving people transfers via mobile money simply increases account ownership, but people really don't use these accounts for anything else. They just lie dormant. Um, and so we're gonna see how this is different in our case. There are also a number of concerns about this rapid digitization of social protection. Um, in many settings, the, the ecosystem is really not developed for people to easily access these very important resources in a timely manner. Um, there are very concerns that because these interventions are targeted at low income populations, they might not fully understand these platforms and how to use them best. And uh, there might be other concerns that there is a well documented gender gap in digital access. And so there's a concern that rapidly digitizing social protection is going to kind of in this way is going to make these things worse. Um, so there are a lot of concerns that this approach to social protection could lead to more harm than benefits. Um, and, and just to quickly clarify a couple of definitional things. So mobile money, just to make sure that we're on the same page, is a very simple service that originated in Kenya and other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. The idea is that using your mobile phone, you can deposit, transfer, and withdraw funds without it being linked to a formal bank account. And for the purposes of this talk, we're going to think about financial inclusion simply as the access to and the usage of very basic financial services. Um, yeah, and th these are just some pictures from uh, the, the picture on the left is actually from Togo. This is a mobile money, typical mobile money kiosk. So if someone receives money on their mobile money accounts, you would go to a shop like this and there would be an agent who would help you convert that digital money into ca actual physical cash. And the picture on the right is um, from Kenya. It basically shows that 
these mobile money interventions are easily accessible on the most basic of feature phones so you through um, very simple menu driven interfaces. Uh, yeah, so what does this paper really look at? We are basically looking at whether humanitarian aid digi delivered digitally in the form I described increases usage of this broader mobile money ecosystem. Um, we look at direct effects. So let's say I pick a, a random subset of people in this room and give you cash transfers into your mobile money account. How does that change the way in which you use the wider set of services you now have access to? And we also look at network effects. All of you are friends. So how does your adoption and usage of mobile money change because a few of your friends have actually received this substantial cash transfer in your accounts? Um, and to quickly preview the findings, uh, we sort of find a very large increase in direct effects where people are using mobile money substantially more when they receive money in their accounts. And then there's a drop off and the long-term result is kind of very modest. We also document uh, a pretty large increase. Uh, we, we document a large network effect. Having a friend who receives this transfer increases your own probability of adoption pretty substantially. Um, and again, this is pretty preliminary work. So we're still trying to refine these results and um, sort of work through it. The, the context we're focusing on is this Novisi program in Togo. Togo is a country of about 8 million people in West Africa. The Novisi program was a government initiated um, response to the COVID emergency. It essentially was a wave of cash transfers in 2020 and 2021. We focus on a particular wave that went out in November 2020, which gave low income populations about five months of cash transfer support. Um, the size of the transfer was larger for female beneficiaries, and it's about roughly half the average monthly wage. That's the way to sort of think about the size of this transfer. Um, the, the program was effectively designed by Emily and Josh and some other collaborators. Um, the eligibility was determined by the geographic and wealth score criteria. And the, what helps us in this, this particular way was that access to these transfers was randomized. So there's a nice clean experiment where a, a random subset of eligible individuals received early access to these transfers. So this gives us a nice setting in which we can study our research questions of interest. Um, and in terms of data, uh, we are essentially using, uh, we, so through a research agreement with the government of Togo, we have access to this the identified mobile money data set from Move, which is one of the two telecom providers in Togo and one of the largest uh, operators of mobile money of the of operators of the mobile money ecosystem. The data set is pretty limited in the sense that it tells us things like the type of transaction, the amount, the date, and if it was a person to person transfer, who the transfer went to. Um, this is sort of the broader context for our study. So Move has about 2.7 million subscribers. As I mentioned, a subset of these subscribers tried to register for this OVC wave that rolled out in November. Uh, and of those who were eligible, um, they were a, a few of the, I mean, half, roughly a little more than half were randomized to receive early access to this transfer in November 2020. The rest started receiving the transfers five months late, six months later in May. Um, these other groups are groups of interest we keep for different analysis in this in the in the um, full paper. Um, I'll sort of talk through some of these groups as we get to it. Um, so the, the first thing we're going to look at is this what happens to people, uh, what happens to people's mobile money use over this like 15 month time period from May 2020 to July 2021. We're essentially going to compare a group of people who received these transfers starting in November 2020 to a set of people who never received these transfers. So um, I, do, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the empirics of it, but we use a pretty straightforward panel event study design. The identifying assumption here is a parallel trend map. So it assumes that in the absence of the cash transfers, the treated and the never treated groups would have followed similar trajectories. Um, to quickly describe the sample, sorry for this very ugly table, but um, the sample is about 60%. 60% of the sample is, is uh, comprised of women, um, roughly 38 years of age on average. And prior to the cash transfer programs, um, about 20% of this sample was using mobile money. Um, so that's, I think, the only numbers really that matter. 
Um, the nice thing about this data is it's very easy to plot descriptively. So if you look at these plots, what this is just simply showing you is the trajectory and the usage of mobile money before the cash transfer started. The large spike you see for about five months is during the period people were receiving money in their mobile money accounts. And then there's this drop off after um, the transfers conclude. But you can sort of already see that there's a reasonable level shift from before to after. Um, we have a large set of outcome variables we're interested in. I think the, the, the ones that are dis displaying at the top here are probably the ones of interest. The first one just simply looks at any mobile money activity in a given month. The second one actually looks is restricted to specific digital transactions such as payments, um, bill payments, cash transfers to friends and family. Basically, you actually using the mobile money interface that people have access to. And you can sort of see that there's an um, increase there as well. So people are not simply using these accounts to withdraw the cash they're getting. They're actually using the wider set of services they're gaining access to. Um, and so these are actually the, the treatment effects from that regression I'm showing you. And I've sort of, I'll explain this figure. So the red dots are for the combined sample. And... Um, the blue, the blue bar and whisker is for men and the green bar and whisker is for women. The interesting thing here is that you see this, as I mentioned, you see this large increase in the mobile money usage during the cash transfer program and a drop off after. But contrary to expectations, um, the usage rates are very similar for men and women throughout. I think this is something that's a little surprising given that we're not really sure how much control women have over their mobile money accounts. There's a ton of anecdotal evidence about phone sharing and the fact that in many, many instances, husbands got their women to sign up for these cash transfer programs and then try to co-op the money. So, so I would treat the, the large effect size for female beneficiaries with some caution, but it is still encouraging that the effects are remarkably consistent. Um, I think, yeah, and this is again sort of, for a different variable, which is, this is just the digital, whether people are making payments or transfers um, through their accounts. And you see a similar sort of pattern. Um, yeah. And we'll quickly talk about the network effects part before I conclude and hopefully we can have some discussion. So for the network effects part, we focus on a completely separate sample. This is a set of individuals who are not part of the experiment and who didn't have a mobile money account at the time these transfers started, but they're allowed to have friends who received the transfer. Um, so they, they could have had friends who were part of either the treatment or the control group. So this, what we call this network is constructed from pre-treatment data. It's a fixed network. It doesn't change over time. We use six months of calling history to figure out um, what this complete social network in this setting looks like. And this is a setting where causal identification is actually pretty challenging because um, you have problems of correlated effects and simultaneity. So we use the randomized transfers as an instrument uh, and use this instrument and use this design to back out the effect of receive of a friend receiving a transfer on your own probability of using it of using mobile money. Um, I really couldn't put this table into a figure, so <laughs> you'll have to bear with the ugly table again. But the main takeaway here is that, um, having a friend who receives a transfer increases your own probability of adoption by about nine percentage points, which is about 25% of, uh, of the, the main and the control group. That's much larger than we expected uh, and a pretty substantial effect size. It's super preliminary results, so we're going to keep work, working on this and trying to make more sense of what's actually driving this. Um, to quickly summarize, we've, we're sort of showing here that we have some preliminary and reasonably robust evidence that this digital delivery of humanitarian aid is generally increasing wider use of the mobile money ecosystem. We find some preliminary effect of substantial network effects, which we're digging into. Uh, the interesting thing, like I said, and something we need to understand a lot better is why these results are very similar for the male and female beneficiaries in the sample. Uh, and all of this evidence is in contrast to the emerging evidence from other settings where there was digital delivery of humanitarian aid during the COVID period. Most of these settings, as I mentioned earlier, find that there's really no wider use of the digital ecosystem. We think there are some specific factors in Togo that played a role. Um, the government subsidized transaction costs initially, 
the agent network in Togo is very, very well developed. It's very easy for people to access and cash out money if they need to and um, make use of other services. And the Togo government has a history of running financial literacy programs uh, in the past before this you know, VC program started, which could have made this transition very much easier. Um, yeah, I mean, and I quickly want to talk about the limitations. As I mentioned, the data set is very, very limited, and there are a number of concerns and potential problems with the way we did this. Phones are not people. Phone sharing, things like that could really change the interpretation of what we're looking at and what we're understanding. We know very little, as I mentioned, about how much access and control women have over their own mobile money accounts. The data is limited. Even though we do have a lot of pre-treatment data, we only have five months of data after the program concluded. So we really don't have a good sense of longer term effects. Uh, our current analysis of network effects really doesn't, it, 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 I think it's pretty well identified, but it doesn't cleanly separate the direct peer effects from nth order effects. So that's, for example, it could, it's also picking up things like my friend had a friend who received a cash transfer. So I adopted because of him and not because of that original friend directly. So there are a few things like that we're trying to sort out, uh, but the initial results are pretty encouraging. And yeah, you know, we can really working on this. Just wanted to quickly thank my collaborators on this, Josh Blumenstock and Matthew Olkers, who was a postdoc here, who's now at the University of South Wales, um, in New South Wales in Australia. <laughs> So I'm not going to ask the first question here. The, you're focusing here on the probability of, of individuals to, to use this network and to continue using this network. Yeah. But it sounds like the big questions you're interested in are how the network, how this mechanism succeeds over the long term, which makes me think that it's very much related to this other theoretical area of the confusion. Yeah. So the idea of like how, how, how does a new technology come to be adopted by people? Right. There's a lot of work in this back in the 40s about hybrid currencies, but it's true for like social online social networks today. Like why does Facebook and Twitter succeed when Google circles or whatever it is? You know? yeah. Right. So like a lot of that work, like things about the interventions, right? So like the, the kind of people that you need to address in order to maximize their own network effects to make the whole thing succeed. Here you're randomizing those assignments of money, right? To yeah. get some money, but have you thought about you know focusing on yeah so so I mean I think the original idea of, so I mentioned that this project came together as a mishmash of several things. What the original idea was to think about technology adoption in this way. And um, I, the, 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 the literature kind of has moved in an interesting direction there for, for interventions of this kind. I think there's a really nice paper by a group at Stanford, which shows that randomized targeting is actually pretty effective in a lot of settings where the process of diffusion is pretty simple and complex diffusion kind of changes the game where, so complex diffusion is in the sense, you might need multiple friends to adopt something before you adopt it. So, so in a world where the mechanism involved is this, you're a good friend of mine, you adopted this new technology, seems cool, you tell me about it, I adopt it, this makes sense. But if then the processes we're thinking about are completely different, this kind of doesn't capture the whole picture. But no, it's very much on our minds. It's, and I think one sub-analysis we're working on actually is exactly trying to figure out which networks are, uh, which kinds of nodes are activating these activating this diffusion. One hypothesis is that mobile money or, or, or like this random targeting has led to people, um, has allowed people to more easily transfer money and communicate with long distance links. So imagine someone living in cities and having family members in rural areas. So one thing we're trying to work at, trying to figure out is whether this particular intervention, the way it was rolled out, changed the sort of um, status quo on that kind of thing and then that has a bunch of implications for sort of why the, diff the process of diffusion happened the way it did and then downstream consequences potentially things like people would migrate move around a, a whole bunch of other risk sharing networks there's a whole other set of things we'd be interested in later on mm -hmm. um, yeah 
Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about or question what's about a different kind of network, which yes. is, uh, you know, I'm curious just in consider or even just broader, more broadly with the adoption of technology like this, you know, how do you think about the robustness of people's access to the network, which allows them to use this transaction? Uh, and like, how does it factor into how you design, for example, your function when you're thinking about whether or not, you know, the participation you see is causal or not? I mean, I'm, I'm curious how you think about you know, whether or not people actually are going to a specific place to use the internet or if they, uh, their phone only works half the day and that's when all their transactions happen, like... No, 100%. I think those are all huge potential limitations and concerns with this type of analysis. And I think the way, the way we did this analysis, it completely ignores a different kind of physical set of exchanges that's happening in these places. You could imagine that because it's very easy to access mobile phones in this setting and it's using the internet and calling is not super expensive. I think usage rates are very, very high, mm -hmm. but then it completely ignores a more informal side of the social network thing where people are meeting in person, um, interacting in their local context, what in villages or in local shops or whatever. It, we don't pick up any of that, all of which also influence some of these outcomes. So. I think one of the real short, one of the real drawbacks of using completely digital data sets to do this kind of analysis is you, you, you're at that risk of really picking up a very, very specific kind of instance of this network. Like it's not complete, um, but it is very useful um, to say for, for things like this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question Is there a uh, way for you to look? From the data, which transactions involve cash inflow that's not part of the government transfer? Yeah, actually, I didn't. I realized I didn't mention that, but everything I showed you excludes the government transfer. So all of these effects we're seeing have nothing to do with the government transfer. Thank you. Um, it's all withdrawals or peer-to-peer -peer transfers, like sending it to a friend or paying utility bills or things like that. Okay, but the withdrawals are also not, not only with simply withdrawing from the government transfers. Correct. It's additional things additional. as well. Thank you. Yeah. We don't count the inflow at all in any of those measures. That's a good point. I should have mentioned that. Okay, that's good. Thanks for asking. Yeah.